Last week we talked a lot, um, a lot about our treasure and how we need to love the Lord our God with uh, all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, love our neighbor as ourself, and we do that with our time, and we do that with our treasure. Today, we are going to be talking about loving God and loving people with our talents. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I personally sometimes feel inadequate. I feel like I don't measure up. I feel like I'm never enough, and I think that really my, my attitude towards myself is the product of our culture, of our environment. We live in an age in which we tell our kids, we tell people, if you dream it, you can do it. We say things like the American dream, right? You can be whoever you want to be, as long as you can think yourself and will yourself uh, and connect with the world in such a way that you strive and you fight and you can accomplish your dreams. Well, there's a cold, hard reality once you enter into adulthood that you soon come to find out. And what is that cold, hard reality? Things sometimes don't work out. Sometimes you don't measure up. Sometimes everything that you thought was possible and you go and try to do it and you find out, wow, this is actually impossible. I mean, think about, for instance, our technology and our our space exploration. We believe one day we will reach the stars. So if you can be anything that you want to be, and one day we'll be able to explore the universe and reach the stars, really the concept that we are bringing to our own selves is that you can be God. You can be anything. You can do anything. You can go anywhere. And there's no restrictions on who you're going to be or what you're going to do. And our kids grow up and they believe what is a cultural lie. And they meet confrontation and failure and disappointment. And when a God falls, a God falls very hard. And so in the church, sometimes we have this inadequacy that we feel like we are responsible for doing everything and being everything. When that's simply not the case. God calls us to serve him with our talents, but that doesn't require us to do everything. That requires us to do something. That doesn't require us to be everything. It requires us to be responsible with what God has entrusted into us. And so the parable of the talents is what we're going to talk about today in Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 14. You know, sometimes we ask this question, okay, I know I need to love God, I know I need to love people, but I don't even know where to start, I don't even know how to do that. Well, Jesus gives us a parable of what the kingdom of God is like, what it looks like to serve God with your talents and with your abilities. And so we're going to talk about three different things this morning. We're going to talk about responsibility, we're going to talk about accountability, and then we're going to talk about productivity. Those are the three highlights that Jesus is going to address in this, in this passage of Scripture. Now, we are in the book of Matthew. Matthew is the author of the Gospel of Matthew, and he is quoting Jesus, right? He's quoting Jesus, and Jesus is specifically teaching his disciples. One of the worst things that you can do when you read the Bible is to think the Bible is specifically written to you. And so when you read the Bible, you take all the words that are in there, and you just apply it to yourself as if Jesus was speaking directly to you, or if Paul was writing right to you. And that's a big mistake, because you'll find yourself reading things that you're like, there's no way I can do this. There's no way I can be responsible for this. There's no way I can be accountable for this. And you'll walk away feeling inadequate because you can't do it all. And so we need to understand when we read the Bible, we ask this question. What did it mean to them? How do we apply it to us? What did this passage of scripture mean to the apostles? How do we apply that to us in principle? And so when we talk about the parable of the talents, that's the kind of approach that we're going to take. Now, as I said, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he is challenging them with their apostleship and with their evangelism. Jesus is telling the apostles, I am entrusting something to you, and you are responsible for how you handle this talent, and you're going to be held accountable for the kind of productivity that you have. And when we talk about how that applies to them, and then we extend that principle to us, we'll be able to bring away some really core principles that we can walk away this morning with this. How do I love God and love people with my talents? Here's the main idea. Jesus says, I'm coming back. I will return. And I want you to be prepared, and I want you to be productive. I'm coming back, apostles. I'm coming back, Christians. I want you to be prepared, And I want you to be productive. And when we love God and we love people and we trust that God is going to work through us for his glory, we will be productive. 
Now let me give you this idea, first of all, with responsibility, right? When you're at work or you're at school or you're in your job or you are facilitating in the church, you are entrusted with a certain level of power, a certain level of influence. And with power comes great responsibility. I think we all know that to be true. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the Roman church in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Paul says this, look, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's true. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is powerful. It leads people to salvation. Paul recognized this fact. I am responsible for something that is very, very powerful. And this powerful thing, has been entrusted to me. And so I bear the burden of the responsibility of sharing this powerful gospel. Now with that in mind about responsibility, let's let's see what Jesus has to say about this parable of what the kingdom of God is like, what it's like to bear this kind of responsibility. Here's what he says. He says, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and he entrusted his money to them while he was gone. And so Jesus is the, he's the master. He is the one who has called his servants together, being the apostles, and he has entrusted money to them for them to bear the burden of responsibility. And so how we could take this to mean is that Jesus has entrusted his disciples with the responsibility of preaching and teaching the gospel. That's what he gave to them. And so Jesus goes on this long trip. He ascended up into heaven after his resurrection. And now his apostles are responsible for sharing the word of God. You guys with me so far? Let's go on in the parable. In verse 15 he says, He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last. And then look at this. Dividing it in proportion to their abilities. And then he left on his trip. You know, as I talked about with our culture, this feeling of inadequacy this feeling of failure, this feeling of I've got to do everything, and if I'm not what everyone else is, and if I don't have the same function as everyone else is, I have failed. But yet, Jesus teaches his apostles this very important lesson. Even amongst the 12 most influential men that have ever come across this earth, he said, I'm going to give something to you. I'm going to give you talents according to what? According to your ability. And that's something that we need to take away as in principle, is that we are not all the same. We are all different. We all have different talents, different abilities, different skill levels. And we are not called to do everything. We are called to be faithful with the something that God has given us, whether that be teaching or administrating or giving or showing hospitality or encouragement. Whatever it is that God has entrusted to you, you are responsible for that, not for everything. You know, sometimes when I hear messages online and I have this feeling of inadequacy because I feel like I've got to do everything, and I hear about missionaries going to Africa and to Asia and South America, and I'm like, man, that's something that I should do, but I'm not able to do that, and I feel guilty. But then I'll remind myself, well, that's not my responsibility because that's not my ability. I have not yet been called to the mission field. And so why should I bear this burden, this guilt, this discouragement that I am unable to do the things that I was never responsible for in the first place? And so if you've ever come to church and you've left with this feeling of discouragement as if I'm not enough, I can't do enough, I'm not able to do all of this stuff that I see everyone else is doing, take courage. God wants you to be responsible for what he has entrusted to you specifically, not with what he's entrusted to everyone else. And so do not be discouraged with where God has has given you abilities and talents. Be encouraged. God wants you to have responsibility with what he has entrusted to you. And so he tells this very same thing to his disciples. I'm going to give you money according to your ability. Now this money represents something different. It represents talents, abilities, skills, opportunities that we all have, and everybody in here is different. All of you have different abilities than what I have. A lot of you know my weaknesses. Some of you know areas that I have strengths in. And that's where I want to excel is in my strengths. And I would like to look to my fellow brothers and sisters for the areas that I'm in, inadequate, that I can't measure up. Because where I am weak, you are strong. And when the body works together, the Bible says it grows. And so Jesus calls his disciples to him. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. If you want to love God and love people, you should be responsible with what I have entrusted to you. And here's the good news. You ready for the good news? When you stand before God, he's not going to hold you accountable for what you were unable to do. 
that gives me some relief. I hope it gives you some relief. God isn't going to hold you accountable for what you are unable to do. Some of you are able to share the gospel. Some of you probably shouldn't share the gospel. Not because, not because it's not a good thing to do, but because it's not an area of your strength, right? Some of us should teach children. Other of us, not so much. <laughs> Some of us are good at building and constructing. Other of us, not so much. 50-50 shot on a good day for me, right? So we need to excel in the areas of our talents and build other people up in the areas of their strengths and their abilities. But we're not going to be held accountable for areas that we don't have any responsibility. And we should take courage in that. And so let us focus. Let us narrow our gaze on what our strengths are and take this principle of the apostles, of what they were talented in and how they excelled. And they were given different talents and abilities. And let us pursue those things and be passionate about those things. We can't all do it all. And so when Jesus says he left on a trip, he's talking about his ascension. I'm going to give these talents to you, apostles. I'm going to ascend up to, into heaven, and now you are responsible for sharing the gospel. Ephesians chapter 4 kind of applies to us. The Bible says this, But to each one of us, grace was given according to, me according to the measure of Christ's gift. Romans chapter 12 verse 6b says, we have different gifts according to the grace that is given us. And that's what's beautiful, being diverse. We're all equal in value, but we're all different in function. None of us have the same abilities at our core of who we are. But in the eyes of God, we all share the same value, whether you have five talents, two talents, one talent, or even a half a talent. We all share the same value. And that's the beauty of the gospel. That's the beauty of the kingdom. You see, your reward in heaven is not based off of what you weren't able to do. It's based off of whether or not you're responsible with what's been entrusted to you. It doesn't matter if you have one talent or five. The question is, is am I honoring God with my responsibility and my worship towards him? That's the challenge to the apostles. And so the key idea is simply this. If we love God and love people with our talents, we will recognize our entrusted responsibility. God, you have given me something very, very valuable and very important, and I want to honor you with that. I want to love you with that, and I want to love people. When we recognize what we've been entrusted with, we will realize that we have an accountability before God for what we've been trusted with. I was volunteering for an extracurricular church activity one time, and I hadn't exactly followed the rules uh, because of my ignorance. Not because I didn't, you know, I was being rebellious, I just really wasn't sure. And the person who was leading this ministry, you know, came down on me in the heat of the moment, um, shouted at me, and I got upset, and so yes, yes, I shouted back. And you know what I said? I'm just a volunteer! Now, what kind of horrible attitude is that? I mean, think about it. I'm just a volunteer for God. I don't bear any responsibility. I don't want any accountability. I'm just a volunteer, and you can't tell me what to do because I'm giving you my time and my talents and my treasure. Nothing but sheer pride and an outburst of anger in my heart and in that moment. I mean, think about that. Sometimes we develop that mentality in the church, don't we? I'm just a volunteer. But yet God says, I've given you and I've entrusted these responsibilities to you. You're the one who signed up for it in the first place, Rick. I'm the one who volunteered, so to speak. I'm the one who said, I will be responsible and I will be accountable for the list of things that you've asked me to do. And when we become a Christian, we are telling God, God, I am giving you myself. I'm entrusting myself to you and I accept the responsibility and the accountability that you have given to me. Whether that's teaching, giving, administrating, building, serving, loving, whatever it is in the kingdom of God, I am not a mere volunteer with no accountability. I am somebody who has been entrusted with the sacred things of God, and I am accountable to him. When we serve in the church, we cannot fall back on this idea that I'm in control and I'm only accountable to myself. I don't care if I'm the preacher or if I'm scrubbing toilets through the week. I'm still accountable. I'm still responsible to God and to my brothers and sisters in Christ. 
And so if you can imagine the, the disciples at this time who went on to the, be, be the apostles, can you imagine if they were to fail and stand before God and say, well, God, I'm just a volunteer. What do you think the Lord would say? I mean, isn't that kind of comical and funny when we, when we think of it in that manner? Here's the thing. Jesus says this in Matthew 25, verse 16. He says, the servant who received five bags of silver began to invest his money, and what did he do? He earned five more. Wouldn't you like to double your investment? Wouldn't that be a good investment if you were able to take all of your money and you were able to double it immediately? Sometimes I go to the local Goodwill, Goodwill, not telling you where it's at because it's my treasure chest, okay? But sometimes I go there and uh, I look for things that I can buy and sell online. Nine times out of ten, I double my money. It's awesome. I'm like, these people don't, you, it's unreal when people donate. It's crazy. Cool board games, little knick-knack toys. Those are like the things that I go after because they're really, really cool. But people do all kinds of furniture and DVDs. I mean, I picked up, I didn't have Iron Man 2. For some reason, I bought Iron Man 1 and Iron Man 3. So the other day, I was able to pick up Iron Man 2, and people are just like giving away their stuff all the time. And so I'll go in there, I'll buy it from Goodwill, and then I'll put it on eBay, and I'll double it. Isn't that awesome? I mean, I made a 1000 bucks last year just doing that. Isn't that cool? You're not telling you where my Goodwill is, so don't even try trying to figure out, okay? The Goodwills around here, they're just really not that great. I mean, everything gets picked through, you know, so I wouldn't even worry about going. Actually, you know, just leave it all to me. I'll go out and make my rounds. But look, you can go to yard sales. I mean, just doubling your investment. That is a great uh, opportunity, and, and you do a great job, right? If you could double your investment. Now, when it comes to our talents, that's the kind of outcome that God wants us to have. He wants us to double it. He wants us to do something with it, not do nothing with it. And look at the other guy. Look what he goes on to say. It says in verse 17, the servant with two bags of silver also went to work. And what did he do? He earned two more. Two guys with different levels of ability, entrusted with talents by God himself, and they both double it. Now that's the kind of work that the kingdom of God and Christians should have. And it goes on to say in verse 18, but, there's always a but, right? It's a good illustration point. But the servant who received the one bag of silver, look what he did. He dug a hole in the ground and he hid the master's money. Jesus is teaching his disciples and he's telling them, I'm entrusting the word of God to you and I'm gonna give you all different gifts, different talents and abilities and I expect you to invest it. I expect you to do something with it. I expect you to multiply and make an impact for the kingdom. And he's teaching them on this sacred principle. How you handle the word of God is how the word of God is going to handle you. See, Jesus expected his disciples to have a, a doubling measure of the gift that he had given to them. He expected them to make an impact with the preaching of the gospel. And here's the question that I pose to you. What has God entrusted to you? What are you talented at? Where are your abilities? What are you able to do? And are you being faithful with what God has entrusted to you? If you're like, I have absolutely no idea what I'm talented at or what I should do, here's what I want to encourage you to do. You can find, there's a ton of these online. Go online, type in spiritual gifts assessment. And you can actually fill out stuff online, questions that will narrow in on areas of your strength. Like I said, whether it's administration or preaching or shepherding or hospitality, whatever it is, go online, take a spiritual gifts assessment and figure out where has God talented me? Where have I been blessed? And then pursue those things. And if you don't know how to get plugged into the local church, send me an email. Talk to me after church. Say, look, Rick, I want to serve God. I want to be responsible with what God has entrusted to me. I don't know where to start. Will you help me? And I absolutely will. We all have responsibility and we will all have accountability before God. And unfortunately, this person who had the least amount of ability decided to take his talent and bury it, not use it. Did he do something evil with it? No. Did he just give it away? No. He did nothing. He didn't even try. And so if we're gonna love God and love people, with all that we are, we've got to at least try to serve him with our talents and our abilities. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, so whether we are in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please him, being God. 
For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. And we will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or the evil we have done in this earthly body. No one gets to escape the accountability. We will all stand before God. Now, Matthew chapter 25 is not a primary teaching text for our eternal judgment. All right, Even though it deals with that language, as we'll see at the end of the chapter, the primary thrust of the passage is this. You will either gain your reward in heaven or lose your reward in heaven. And I think for, for me, right, I want to be responsible, and when I'm held accountable, I want Jesus to say, hey, you did a great job. Well done, you good and faithful servant. Come, I'm going to give you even more. And that's what I think we fail to realize, is that this earth is a journey for the next one. We are not going to be floating up in space, right? We're not going to just spiritually fly around with metaphysical, disembodied spirits. We are going to inherit a new heaven and a new earth. That's what the gospel promises. And the things that you do now have an impact on what you receive in the next life. And if you love serving God and loving people now in this life, and you're responsible with it, when you are held accountable, you will get even more. You'll get to love more. You'll get to serve more. You'll get to follow your passions more. And so don't waste your life. Don't think that this life has no meaning and that one day you'll just float up in heaven. No, 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 no. It has a direct impact on the new heavens and the new earth that you will live in. Have you developed a skill? Carpentry? Mechanic work? Astrology? Teaching ability? Knowledge? You will carry it with you. And that's cool. I mean, we're going to do so many wonderful things. I know it's, it's weird to think about. Am I really going to be driving around cars? I don't know specifically. But what I do know is the kind of work ethic and abilities that you develop here will directly impact there. And that's my encouragement to you. Be responsible because one day you'll be held accountable. If we really love God and love people with our talents, we will welcome accountability. We won't look to each other, to God, and say, I'm just a volunteer. Oh, no, 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 no. We will take this challenge seriously because it affects our eternity. And when we're responsible and we understand we're going to be held accountable, we'll finally be able to look at our productivity. What are we producing? The five-talent man produced ten total. The two-talent man produced four total. The one-talent man was wicked and disobedient, the Bible says, and he buried it in the ground, and he didn't do anything evil. He just did nothing. And that's where we lose Let's go on, starting in verse 20. Look what happens. Jesus said, The servant to whom he entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more. Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Man, there's nothing better than just celebrating. Isn't that great? I mean, it's fun to attend a good party and celebrate the hard work that you have done. Look what happens to the two-talent man. The servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned you two more. And the master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Look, guys, God has not set you up for failure. When he has entrusted certain talents and abilities to you, he knows you can do it. He knows you have the the ability. He knows you have the skill. It's just where is the motivation? And God wants to celebrate with you. He wants to appreciate you. Now, we can err on the side of saying, well, I'm just a volunteer. And at the same time, we can err on the side of showing no appreciation for each other at all. Sometimes this happens in marriage, right? Well, this is your responsibility. This is what you signed up for after all. When you stop appreciating each other in marriage, husbands who work hard, wives who work hard, husbands who clean, wives who clean, When we stop appreciating appreciating each other for the small things, we really have failed each other. Look, if anybody's entitled to say that's your responsibility, it is God. And what does God do when we are faithful, when we follow through? He celebrates. We should do that exact same thing with each other. Hey, man, good job. Hey, man, I appreciate what you've done. 
Hey, man, we've accomplished our goals. Hey, man, I see you serving God faithfully. Thank you for what you're doing. Hey, man, or or not just, I'm not trying to be gender exclusive here, okay? You know, I am a little, uh, you know, PC, politically correct. When I say man, I'm talking about general, all of us, okay? So, hey, girlfriend, you know, I wouldn't say that because that kind of sounds weird. Doesn't that kind of make me look weird? I think I'm just going to stick with man. But, hey, man, I am so proud of you. You've done a great job. God wants to celebrate with us. And he's prepared to, even though we don't deserve it, even though we have failed in time and time again, when we stand before God, he isn't calling for effectiveness. He's calling for faithfulness. He's not calling for us to be perfect. He's calling for us to be faithful. Where's your heart when it comes to your talents and your abilities? When you fail, are you willing to pick yourself back up and try again? Because why? You're responsible. And that's the thing. People think that God wants everything. When in reality, God wants first. God doesn't want all your money. He wants you to honor him first with it. God doesn't want all your time. He wants you to honor him first with it. God doesn't want all of your talent. He wants you to honor him first with it. God doesn't want you to always just talk about him. He wants you to honor him first with it. There should be a touch of God in everything that we do. And so that's our, that's our encouragement this morning. We need to be productive with what God has entrusted to us. We should be faithful. Now the first two servants, they were responsible. And look, look at what they were happy to do. God, look at what I've done. Look at what, how I've honored you. They welcomed accountability. And that's how you know something is off is when we run away from accountability and we're not willing to talk about our productivity, we know that something's gone wrong. We know that we're probably not doing what we should be doing and honoring God with what we've been entrusted with. It feels good to be recognized for our hard work, but when we run away from our celebration, we know that our calibration is off. And so let's recalibrate. And starting this day forward, let's decide to trust God with our time, with our treasure, and with our talents. So if God were to decide to return right now, here's the the real question. How would you feel about your responsibility? If he were to come back right now and you were to stand before God, what would you say? Would you say, here, master, look at what I've done? Or would you say, hey, man, really didn't want to mess up the whole kingdom business, so I just decided to take the things that you gave me and I didn't do anything with it? What would you say? Let's continue on in this passage It says in verse 24, then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, look at his excuse. I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant, gathering crops you didn't cultivate, and I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. He's in trouble. He's in big trouble. He was apathetic and didn't do anything. He had zero productivity. He's faithless. He's irresponsible. Here's why he's faithless. He's faithless because he misrepresented the master. He said, this is, what you, this is who you are. This was really your problem, not mine. That's what Adam and Eve did. When God came down and he tried to deal with their sin, you know, both of them they, they did, they did this. He did it. She did it. Their problem, not mine. Somebody else is responsible. Don't we do that? Whenever we get in trouble, whenever we mess up, we always try to find somebody else to be responsible because we don't want to be held accountable. When probably the real reason is, is because we felt such gracelessness in our life that we are so afraid to actually talk about our failures because everyone can be so harsh and mean. And so here's what this guy does. He says, look, master, the reason why I didn't do anything with what you gave me is because you were too harsh. You are a slave driver. He's faithless. He's irresponsible because he didn't take the mission seriously. He said, look, not only are you the problem, but I was kind of afraid I'd actually lose your money. Look what the master replies with. You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew that I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. What Jesus does here is he uses what's called an ironic contrast. It's basically this. Even if you thought that this was true and you knew I was like this, why didn't you act on it? You knew I was going to penalize you for not doing anything. You believed these hard truths about me, and even if they were true, you still should have acted. You see, the servant is lying. He's trying to wiggle his way out of it, and it's not going to happen. And Jesus is telling his apostles, look, I'm entrusting this to you. You're responsible. You're going to be held accountable. 
And it doesn't matter what you say to me on the day of judgment. We're either going to celebrate or you're going to lose your reward. And we do stuff like this all the time, right? We spill something on our shirt and we go, oh, great. Not that it's like literally great, but we're using ironic contrast. And so that's what Jesus is saying. Even if you believe this was true, you should have done something. I can't tell you how many times I have failed in ministry, fatherhood, husbandship. I have failed so many times. But we get back up and we try again. We get back up and we have a do-over. We get back up and we try to honor God with what he's entrusted to us. The worst thing that you can do is nothing. And so he is saying, you are irresponsible, you are wicked. To be wicked means to be evil, malicious. And Jesus really calls it how it is. It's not that he didn't, you know, he was just like, oh, even keel about it. Oh, no. He was malicious in his heart. He had intention to harm. He, he had lost his original value. He had become corrupt because he was apathetic. He said, you're lazy, obsolete, slothful. You're dragging your feet. You're unwilling to act. In the classical sense, it means to shrink back. You see an opportunity where you're gifted in, and you shrink back from it. You see an opportunity to make an impact for the kingdom of God, and you shrink back from it. You pull away. And look, I know that it's true, because I know in the church, people can be mean and harsh and critical. But we should honor God with our talents and our abilities, with our treasure and our time, irregardless of the people around us, because we're here to serve God. Remember, God isn't going to hold you accountable for what you're unable to do. And the issue isn't whether you've got five, two, or one. The issue is whether or not you're productive with what you've been entrusted with. And look what happened to the wicked slave. Now remember, there are words that are used to describe punishment in the eternal sense. But what he's talking about within the context of scripture is losing their reward. Then he ordered this. Take the money from this servant who was faithless and give it to the one with 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so because he was faithless, and irresponsible, he was stripped of his responsibility. And this is God saying, you don't want to do it? Okay, I'm going to give it to somebody else. Somebody who recognizes the value, who appreciates the opportunity, who doesn't view teaching children, or serving communion, or cleaning the church, or teaching a class, or being a part of the welcome team, who doesn't view it as a burden, but views it as an opportunity to love God and love people. And so a second punishment is this. You're useless. I'm taking away from you what should have been given to somebody else because you weren't productive. And so he loses his reward, in other words. And yeah, we could all make it to the new heavens and the new earth, but we are very naive to think, well, as long as I make it, I'm okay. Oh no, because here's the problem. When we are faithless with our talents, our time, our treasure, and our testimony. It places us in a jeopardy situation that moves away from the cross and away from salvation. I think it's a whole lot harder to go to hell than what most people say it is. It is tough. I mean, God's grace is incredible. And he loves us and stays with us and is patient with us and long-suffering with us. It takes a lot of hard work to not spend eternity in heaven with God. And it's not nearly as hard to accept God's salvation as what some of us make it out to be. It's really quite simple. You believe these things, you obey these things, you follow these things. The gospel is one of the most simple messages, and sometimes we overcomplicate it. And so the message today is simple. Love God and love people with your talents, with your abilities. He's not going to hold you accountable for what you're unable to do. Just trust him and follow him with what you are able to do. I was reading a story. Uh, it was in a book called Messy Spirituality about um, a woman who had immigrated to New York. And she was evangelized and became a Christian, but she couldn't speak any English. Uh, all she knew was Spanish. And the primary mission field were English-speaking people. And so when she was talking with the, the translator, she really, really, really wanted to serve but she had this huge barrier in front of her that she wasn't able to communicate with anybody. And so what the translator told her to do is, I want you to ride on this bus that travels around the inner city, and I want you to love on the kids that come on the bus. And so he taught her two phrases. 
The two phrases were this, God loves you and I love you. And she gave a hug to every single kid that came on that bus. Hundreds of kids, year after year, as she developed in the English language, she hugged those kids and she said, God loves you and I love you. One talent, one ability. It's not anything that we would say is magnificent or incredible, but to God, it was magnificent and incredible. Why? Because she was faithful with what had been entrusted to her. I don't care if today you start with one thing. And maybe you already are serving, and maybe you already are loving God and loving people with what he's entrusted to you. Thank you for doing that. Praise God for you. But maybe you haven't started. <clears throat> maybe you aren't doing anything. Try one thing today, to love God and love people with your talents. Let's stand and let's pray.